if we could only be aware of the words we use to describe ourselves, we would have such a wake-up call. Because while you can choose to be negative or positive, it is up to you. What you can't choose is what you do to your body when you say, this is killing me, this will be the death of me, the end of my rope, I'm losing my shit, I'm falling apart, this is a nightmare. If you could look in your body and see the cortisol you create, the inflammation you create by being negative, you would actually really put a break on negative thinking. Two, one, zero, three, Hello and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. When I was a teenager, my mom gave me the book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And since then, I've been, I was obsessed with the power of your subconscious mind and, and how our mind works and how we can manifest things and become even different people just by commanding our subconscious mind. The mind is so powerful and I've studied with many leaders and luminaries and I've rewired my brain to heal trauma, for confidence, for self-love many, many times in my life so I can become the woman that I am today. And a long time ago, before I started coaching, I was a personal trainer. But still back then I was fascinated with mindset and I studied NLP and all that and when I used to stretch my clients at the end of the session, I would put them in a trance state and talk to them and put embedded command in their subconscious mind about how successful they are and how their bodies were strong and healing fast and flexible. And they got incredible results. And I got so into the mindset that I decided to become a coach. And throughout my coaching, I used a lot of NLP and a lot of hypnosis. And I got amazing results because these things work. When you talk to the subconscious mind, you heal, you heal things that are hidden in the subconscious mind. So I got a client to get married within a year of working with me. I got one to stopped smoking. She was a heavy smoker. She stopped smoking after two sessions of working with me. And I really loved coaching and I loved being in my gift. And I always know that I love to learn and expand. And in 2018, my husband, Stefan Spencer, interviewed Marisa Peer uh, to his podcast, Get Yourself Optimized. And I listened to the podcast and we were driving in the car and I listened to it and I told him, wow, this woman is incredible and I want to learn everything that she teaches. And, and so I did. Um, I started taking her online course. And then everything kind of stopped when I became a mom because I had this beautiful, incredible miracle and I wanted to just be there for him every minute and I didn't want to miss a bit a bit so I I stopped my coaching and I was it was all focused on my baby and now looking back I recognize that for about I think a year and a half or, or two years I was suffering from uh, postpartum depression but when you're in it you can't even see it and I didn't have any desire and any motivation to really work hard at my coaching. I would coach here and there, but nothing like the big dream I had before. Then a lot changed. Uh, Marisa came to Miami and I took her live training in last year. And it was so incredible because just to have the opportunity to study with her. So I, I went there and it was one of the most incredible experiences and very uplifting because we as therapists got a chance to work on each other. So they were breakthroughs in the room every day, all day long. And we were just like every day I would come home bigger, more expanded, more connected to who I am and more healed because I was, I was doing intense trauma healing every single day 
and the community and the people are just so beautiful and I will forever and ever cherish that experience and a lot of the people I met are still my friends and they are incredible therapists and just like loving kind empathic human beings and I'm so grateful to to be a part of this community I feel very blessed that I was able to study with with the with the Marissa and to add RTT sessions to my coaching practice it just makes it so much uh, so much greater uh, to have that aspect of her teachings as well as my teachings and my coaching for Orion's method even though I, I give the sessions separately to just respect her methods and her her rights to RTT uh, so that's what I do now I do RTT sessions and I do coaching sessions and it just works beautifully together Marisa Peer if you've never heard of her um, I don't know how you didn't but she's she is one of the best of the best of the best she is a world-renowned speaker rapid transformation therapy trainer and best-selling author she has nearly three decades of experience as a therapist and has been named Best British Therapist by Men's Health Magazine and featured in Tucker Guide to Britain 250 Best Doctors. Marisa uses her experience of treating clients, including rock stars, CEOs, elite Olympic athletes, royalty and Oscar-winning actors to inform her life-changing speeches and lectures. In 2015, Marisa launches her Marisa Peer Method School, teaching her unique method for the first time to an audience in London, Canada, the US, and Australia. I feel blessed and honored to have her in my life, to be able to study with her, and to share her wisdom with you today. So, without further ado, on to the show. Hey, Marisa, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I am super excited to have you here. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm super excited to be here. It's a great honor. Yeah. Um, so I'm one of your biggest fans. Uh, I have taken your training. I love your method. You got so many awards for being like the, the most, one of the most incredible therapists in, in the world. And I want to know, how did you even become a therapist? What, what was your drive to want to help people in that way? Well, you know, I had an amazing mentor. My father was quite a guy. He was an amazing head teacher. And his mission was to make every child feel important. He used to say to me, you know, every child that I meet, I want to imagine they've got a sign on their forehead saying, please make me feel important. And he really, that was his motto that he lived by. And he showed me every day that helping people was what life was all about. And he really went a distance to help people. And he showed me every day that his whole fulfillment came from helping people. So I was very influenced by him. And of course, my mother, on the other hand, was very unfulfilled, very beautiful, very unhappy, very frustrated. So I saw the difference. My father had a job that engrossed him, fulfilled him, gave him everything. And at a very early age, I picked up, you need a fantastic career. You need a career that's rewarding, fulfilling, gives you meaning and purpose because that allows you to cope with all the slings and arrows of life. So that he influenced me the very most. And I wanted to be a child psychologist, um, but that wasn't for me. And then I thought I might be a teacher of small children, but I realized actually that being a therapist was for me. And I realized that when I left college and went to work for Jane Fonda, which was phenomenal fun. But, but Jane and indeed so many people in the work industry in the late 80s all had um, eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia, uh, author, orthorexia, which is a little bit clean eating, body, compulsive disorder, compulsive exercising. And I realized that this was a mental illness being trapped with let's work out, let's live on celery juice, let's fast. And I was fascinated by how many people in my classes for Jane were just obsessed with 
what they looked like on the outside, not the inside. And that led me to a lifelong study of human behavior, which my father had kind of begun in me anyway. And I, my, my primary I was looking at why, you know, overeating is an emotional, you can't fix it with working out and forcing yourself on a diet. In fact, I've always been amazed that the whole diet industry is based on self-hatred, hate your body, do a punishing workout, force yourself, deny yourself. And the only way to have the body you love is actually to love the body you have so much that you treat it with respect. So I came from that, this, this self-hatred we have, and, and the media certainly contributes to that. So that was my beginning. Yeah, today nine-year-olds have body image issues. It's really, really bad. Yeah, and you ask them what they want, and they go, I'm, I'm going on a diet, I, I'm fat. It, it just, what we've done to, the, to each generation in terms of body image is just horrific. I think one day people will look back and, and just be absolutely shocked that we, we body shame people like that on an epic scale. So that was where at my beginning. But then I realized that people would ring me up and go, hey, I, I know you work with weight loss. My neighbors lost 100 pounds. My friends stopped eating sugar. But me, I've got a fear of elevators, and I only want to see you. I go, yeah, fine, sure. And then I realized that the diversity was so fulfilling, working with, with everything from infertility, <clears throat> to phobias, to panic attacks, as well as the eating issues. Then I began to work with a lot of children and schools, and it's really rewarding. So I love the fact that I no longer niche. I see people for everything, and it's been the most rewarding job in the world. I will never, ever retire. I, I love it as much today as I did 30-odd years ago when I began. Yeah, and I, I love watching you speak about how, helping people. It's so freaking amazing. And uh, just by experience, your training, I'm, I'm in such awe and, and I have so much respect to, to what you created. So you created Rapid Transformation Therapy. Uh, how, do you, how did you come up with that? And what is different between RTT and other therapists? Well, first of all, I never want to diminish other therapists. I think all therapists have a great heart and a real calling to help people. But I was always amazed that therapy is the only healing modality. It says, bring me your pain, and over a long period of time, we'll, we'll build a relationship, and then we'll try and help you. You see, if you turn up at the emergency room or indeed the dentist or indeed the chiropractor going, I'm in terrible pain here. They don't say, well, we need to build up trust over a long time and then we can begin to help you. They say, you're in pain. Let me get you out of pain. Let's get out that infected tooth. Let's set that broken arm. Let me look at your back and see what's out of alignment. I always thought therapy should be the same. It should offer almost immediate release of pain. That doesn't mean the client doesn't come back. But if someone comes to me and says, I'm having panic attacks, I'm addicted to cake, I can't find love, I've got, I'm have got, i cripplingly shy, or I have insomnia that's ruined my life, or indeed I shout at my children, it's just terrible. I begin immediately in the first session. Uh, it's almost like a recipe. I, I look at what happened. I start to interrupt the client's belief system. I start to interpret with them what's gone on. And then I become rather like a coder. So RTT is a very good formula. You begin like a detective gathering information, what's gone on here. No one is born unable to leave cookies. No one is born fearing attention. After all, a baby's first experience is being observed and looked at and assessed. And they never look away and go, don't look at me. I got no clothes on and I got these really fat thighs. So we investigate what happened. We interpret how that's led to the current day issue. And then we interrupt the belief system, which is very powerful. And clients actually love that. And then rather like a coder, we start installing better software. Really, if your computer had a bug, and you got an IT, you go, this has got a bug, let me upgrade it, update it, and then it'd be all fast and new. And many clients have a bug in their thinking that they're not even aware of, and it's the same thing, let's remove that bug, install better software so you can be the amazing person you're always meant to be. And I find many clients' issues come from the lies they tell themselves. 
My dad left when I was one, therefore I'm not lovable. My mother wanted a boy, therefore I'm a disappointment. I didn't have a college education, so I'm never going to amount to anything. I don't look like those models in the magazine, so therefore I'm not enough. And, you know, the lies other people tell us are hurtful, but the lies we tell ourselves are so damaging. And we don't even realize when we say, you know, I'm exhausted. My kid makes me want to die. This commute will be the death of me. If I look at a cake, I get fat. That one of the rules of the mind is that every thought you think the body starts to manifest. After all, if you feel embarrassed, you blush. If you watch a movie, your eyes can fill up with tears as something that isn't real. If you think of food, your stomach will rumble. If you think of sex, you can feel very aroused. So we know that every day we think a thought and we make that thought real, which is fine when you're thinking about eating or sex, but not fine when you're thinking about not being enough, not being good enough, and if only we knew that every word we speak and every thought we think is a blueprint that our mind, body, and psyche work to make real. If we knew that and were taught that, we would start to change that blueprint all the time because it's such an easy change to make. Mm -hmm. So when somebody come to um, to you or to an R R RTT therapist, are you, do you still get private clients? I don't see many clients. I've now trained 11,000 people in my method. And some of the people I've trained are just extraordinary. They're every bit as good as me, maybe even better than me. So I'm now very lucky that I can refer people who contact me all over the world. I do see people occasionally. If it's a very interesting case, a very compelling case, a very worthy case, I will still see clients. I'm currently creating a, a whole weight loss program for coaches so at the moment I'm working with three or four different people and filming all of that for my new program so I do see clients and I love seeing clients and of course clients give me my stories and my new book is full of 10 client stories which I collected over the last few years and my next book is going to be about 10 children and adolescent stories so I'm still seeing people because they are the material for my current book and indeed my next one. Many of us have been through some stressful times in the last couple of years. I know I have, and I am very grateful for my coaches and for the hypnotherapy sessions that I took that helped me, and I want to extend this to you as well. If you want to feel unstuck, break through some limiting beliefs, maybe you want to lose weight or attract the love of your life, maybe you just want to step into your power then do yourself a favor and book an RTT session with me. RTT stands for Rapid Transformation Therapy, and it is indeed very rapid. Most people get their breakthroughs within one to three sessions, and then they just step into the person they want to be, and they change their lives, they change their health, they change their identity. I love you, I'm here for you, and I want to help you. And as my podcast listener, you are getting 25% off your first RTD session. Woohoo! So go to speakwithorion.com and book a 15 minute call with me, speakwithorion.com, and we'll take it from there. And now back to the show. Your new book that is coming up is Tell Yourself a Better Lie. What? Yeah, I'm going to show it to you. Here it is. Tell Yourself a Better Lie. And, you know, a lot of people don't like that title, but I think the title makes you stop and think, title. what does that even mean? Well, it means that, yeah, I love it. I'm, I think it's the right title because it says if you're prepared to lie to yourself, you know, my kids are killing me. My husband is driving me crazy. My boss is the boss from hell. I just can't lose weight no matter what I do. I'm unable to function without a drink. If you are willing to lie to yourself, when people say things like, I, I'm the size, my legs, I'm the size of a horse. I could eat a horse. 
uh, I've been drinking for 24 hours nonstop, which clearly can't be true. I mean, I'm imagining at some stage in that 24 hours, you peed, you ate, and you probably had a little nap too. So if you're prepared to lie to yourself, at least tell yourself a better lie. And that's as simple as my memories, like a sieve, I forget everything. To I have a phenomenal memory. I can't lose weight no matter what I do. I have an incredible metabolic rate. My boss is a nightmare. Well, my boss is a challenge to everyone, but I've got amazing skills and I'm an asset to this company. You might say, well, it's not true. Neither is the fact that you could eat a horse. So it doesn't have to be true. It's just look at the lies you tell yourself. My head is killing me. I'm dying of stress. I'm exhausted. I'm chronically tired. Just change that. I'm a little dehydrated. I do need a bit more sleep. If we could only be aware of the words we use to describe ourselves, we would have such a wake-up call. Because while you can choose to be negative or positive, it is up to you. What you can't choose is what you do to your body when you say, this is killing me. This will be the death of the end of my rope. I'm losing my shit. I'm falling apart. This is a nightmare. If you could look in your body and see the cortisol you create, the inflammation you create by being negative, you would actually really put a break on negative thinking. And that's always been my mission to help people. No, yeah, I, I totally, I totally believe that. Um, I, I had a lot of stress in in the last few months, and I have created a a, a gut problem, <laughs> and now I'm healing it. But yes. um, I can totally see the connection uh, between between the gut and the brain, and what we think, and and our healing process. Yeah. Can you share us? What doctors call the gut? Yes. Can yes, I please, share? Please. Yeah, not long ago, somebody wrote to me and said, you know, I've got terrible diarrhea. It's all happened in the last year. It's come out of nowhere. I just don't understand it. I'm, I can't, I'm always in the bathroom. It's ruining my life. I can't go to meetings. And when I spoke to him, I noticed what he said all the time. I'm losing my shit. And I said, do you think that could be? Oh, no. <laughs> because it's such a stupid lie. Nobody would leave the house. If that was really true, you wouldn't go into a meeting. You wouldn't go on a date. You wouldn't go on a train or an airplane. You'd be mortified. And yet we say this thing. Somebody said to me, you know, it's so bizarre because I listen to you speaking. I've never met you, but I've had very painful feet. My foot arch has collapsed, and it's been really painful. And I notice the, the one thing I say every day is I just can't stand it. I can't stand it. My kids don't put the jars back on the peanut. I can't stand the fact that my husband doesn't rinse out the sink after he's shaved. I can't stand the fact that my house is a mess. And I was really aware of, wow, how much do I say? And I stopped saying it. I said, I can deal with this. I've got amazing coping. You wouldn't believe it, but within 10 days, my foot arch has actually started to go back. And I've had no more foot pain since the day I stopped saying I can't stand it because when you repeat something over and over again, it actually becomes an imprint, an imprint that stays with you. So when you say, no matter what I do, I can't sleep. It's just a nightmare. I'm up all night watching the clock and I can't go to sleep. I can't force it. You see, that's a lie because when you get into bed, where are you going? You've got into bed to not go anywhere. And we're only born with two fears, and one of them is falling. The other is loud noises. Every other fear is acquired. So if our, one of our predominant fears is falling, and you say, I must fall asleep, I can't that fall asleep, sense. it's very confusing. Do you mind just say this yeah, instead? When I get into, get into bed, it comes to me. It descends upon me like a mist. It covers me like the wonderful warm weighted blanket. And I enjoy beautiful sleep until my required wake up time. You might go, well, that's not true. But neither is I can't fall asleep. So it's just a question of looking at your words and going, hey, I, these are my words. Why don't I update them, upgrade them and change them? And, and there's a wonderful person in my book called Tara who 
had lost two babies at birth and her two existing children, one had a heart defect. And she said, I'm just numb, I can't feel. But what she was telling herself was, I, I, I can't feel. If I feel I will fall apart, my heart has been broken so much. I didn't even want it to mend because it would just break again. And when I said, but you have a very functional heart, it just knows how to keep repairing itself. She actually was was so transformed by realizing that in telling herself, I've got to be numb, I've got to shut down, that's how I cope. She wasn't coping. She was numb. It was a terrible experience for her two boys to see the shutdown mother. And she said, I never cry, you know. And in that instant, she cried, and it was so cathartic mm -hmm. for her. And so every story in that book is... It's fascinating. There's somebody with OCD, somebody with alcoholism, somebody with bulimia. And I remember talking to the person with alcoholism and I said, you know, darling, I know you think you're broken, but you're not broken. You had broken parents and broken parenting experiences, but you are not broken. You're wonderful. You're lovable. And, you know, it's it's a choice to go. I'm No one's going to love me. I'm unlovable. My dad left when I was one, never even put pay child support, that's a lot, that's true. But it doesn't mean you're not worthy of anything. Or you could say, it's a shame about my dad, but I only came through him, not from him, and I'm deeply lovable, magnetically lovable, and I can find love. And one of my most, the thing that makes me feel so great the most is often people say, you know, I, I started to go, I'm lovable, magnetically lovable. Love is available to me. And would you believe it? This guy hit on me in a store. No one's ever done that. My, someone said to me, you know, my next door neighbor, I hadn't even noticed him. When I began to say I'm lovable, suddenly <laughs> spoke to me over the fence and said, something about you. I, I have to talk to you. I've got to get hair. to know you. And now we've been together for five years. Yeah. He said, I, I don't know what it is, but you have this magnetic. And she said, I've been saying I'm magnetically lovable. And he said, you have this magnetic presence. And she said, isn't that funny? I'd never seen him. He'd never seen me. But when I began to say I'm magnetically lovable, like a laser, he locked on to me. So I've got to get to know you. And we're still together. I'm very happy. But, you know, it, it's a choice. You're going to say no one loves me or I'm lovable. I'm stupid or I, I'm smart. I can't get things to last. I have an amazing ability to make every, everything I touch turns to you know what becomes everything I touch works out because it is a choice. In fact, on Christmas Eve, my husband and I were flying to Texas and we'd had a very challenging morning. And he said to me, you know, I really marvel at your ability to not get stressed. I said, well, it, it's a choice. I could go, oh, my God, this is a nightmare. What a day, a disaster. I could go, well, it's a challenge, but, you know, the bigger a person you get, the more challenges you have. And I consider myself very lucky that my father was super positive. My mother was probably the most negative person you could meet. And they were both my teachers. And I knew I had a choice. I could be like her or I could be like him. My mother was a wonderful, loving person, but I'm happy and negative. And I realized very early on, I, I was going to go my father's way, which is to look at life differently. And in fact, they both died very close to my father said to him, I've had a wonderful life, wonderful. I've had a wonderful career. And he was so happy, even as he was passing. And my mother was very unhappy and thought, wow, it even affects the way you die. It affects the way you live, but it also affects the way you die. And he had quite a beautiful death in many ways because he had no regrets, not a single one. I think, well, imagine going through life with no regrets. I love yeah, that. I want that too. Um, mm, well, it's, it's also a choice. You know, I made a mistake, but I learned something. I dated an idiot, but thank God they left me because here I'm with my beautiful partner, with my first person wasn't an idiot or a narcissist or mean, I wouldn't be with my wonderful husband or wife I, I now. Relate, so yeah. even that I is a relate. choice. I've always been an abusive narcissist and yeah. I was completely crushed. Yeah. But I knew that I knew I, that I was I was I was such a shadow of myself. I couldn't even walk down the street, look at people in the eye. I was yeah. totally scared of everything i drank I, it was horrible 
but I knew that there was, you know, I went to a psychologist who wanted to send me to a psychiatrist, who wanted to put me on medication. And even though those can be good for some people, I knew that I had a little light in me and I can hold on to that light because I've done it in the past and I can be, I can rise like the Phoenix. And then I started really conditioning my mind every day to, to feel better. And I did, I had pages and pages and pages of affirmations and I did mirror work from Louise Hay. And the first few times I did that, I couldn't do it. I started crying every time I did that because I couldn't say I love you to myself. It was too hard, too painful because I hated myself. And then I knew the power of laughter. Mm. So I went on YouTube. I started to, you know, look at some cat videos. And then I started, I studied martial arts. I studied MMA and Aikido because I said, nobody ever is going to hurt me again physically. So I really strengthened myself and I really believe in the power of the mind. And I can, I, I'm really grateful for my mom because she, when I was a teenager, she gave me two books. She gave me Louise Hay, uh, You Can Heal Your Life. And she gave me The Power of Your Subconscious mm-hmm. Mind by Joseph uh, Murphy. And those books. That's two amazing. Yeah, those are two amazing books. And, and that gave me the, 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 the understanding that no matter what, we can connect to a higher power. We can change our conversations. I was in a place where, so that guy, he was telling me many lies about myself. He would put in, put in me down. Like every part of my body was ugly. I was ugly and fat and all kinds of really, really bad, bad words. And when you hear it enough times and what predators do, they isolate and you hear it so many times that you take it all, you take on the lies and then you tell yourself that lie and you keep telling that yourself that lie and then you got to break yeah. the pattern. So how do you, how do you, um, help people break the path? And you're so right. The lie he told you was bad, but then you yeah. continue to lie. My people say, my parents have never amount to anything. No one in our family has ever done that. We, you can't have that. That's too much. So when someone else tells you a lie, they have an agenda. People like your ex want to diminish you. A critical person, it's a bit like if this was a seesaw, here's you and here's a critical person. But you see, in the critical person's mind, you're actually elevated and they're diminished and they only have two choices to make this mm-hmm. happen. They must diminish you or elevate themselves to a narcissist with nobody will love you. You're not good enough. Who's going to take you on? Or they might go, well, I'm smarter than you. I've got a better education. I've got more money. But each thing is designed to make this go to this. But you see, we have a choice to not let that in. Unhappy people criticize. Critical people without question have the most criticism reserved for themselves. When you come across a critic, the best thing you goes, oh, this is an unhappy person. Nobody wakes up and goes, wow, my life's amazing. Who can I troll today? I'm so happy and fulfilled. Who could I go online and diminish and hurt? It just doesn't happen. Critical people need other people to be critical so they can feel equal in their misery, whereas happy people, evolved people, tend to praise. They tend to say wonderful things like, darling, It doesn't matter that you didn't get that job. You'll get another one. I'm so sorry your husband left, but he's an idiot. Who could leave you? They don't go, well, of course he left. You've got cellulite. Your breasts are sagging. You've got three kids. What have you got to offer the world? A friend would never say that, but we say those things. things Of course they left. Even when we know better. (laughs) Oh, I mean, if if we spoke to our friends the way we speak to ourselves, they'd be long gone. So we have to identify and listen to what we say to ourselves. You know, I at last year I was lying on the sofa and I heard what says my husband, I'm chronically tired. I went, no, I'm not chronically tired. I'm probably dehydrated. I need to take a nap. But I still was surprised that I said that word chronic and I immediately reversed it because it doesn't matter if you say it, it's how fast you change it. I'm falling apart. No, I'm just challenged. I'm this commute is a nightmare. This this line in the store is hell. There is no hell lining up in a store to buy groceries. Hell is not having any money to buy groceries and going to a store 
in somewhere where there, there aren't any groceries to buy, even if you have the money. So we, we really have to understand there's no hell on the freeway. There's no hell in your local supermarket. And you need to change those words. It's not how to have people in your life that you're buying food for and going home and cooking for that love you and you love them. So the reframing is very important. And you came, you had a narcissist partner. I had a super negative mother, but I just learned very early on, I don't want to be like that. She was a teacher, of course. And Unhappy people, just the way successful people leave clues. Unhappy people leave clues. They say things like, it's all going to go wrong. This will all end in tears. I knew this wouldn't work out. It's all ruined now. The plane is late, so the holiday is ruined. I couldn't get one ingredient, so the dinner is ruined. No, it's not. It's, it's all a choice. And you have to just start choosing to understand that rather like a radio, if you have an next thing, no one's going to love you. No one's going to take you on. You're not all that, that you have a choice. Do not let it in. You don't have to let anything in. You can say, well, thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Luckily, I don't agree. Or I just leave that with you because if you can just remember the truth, the person criticizing you, is unhappy about themselves. And as long as you can hold on to that, you'll be okay. Yeah. So there's so many things you can do. And, and one of the most important, and I've noticed this working with clients for 30 years, is that when you're a child, this is the tragedy of having parents who are not quite up to the job. When you have parents who don't meet your needs, the child doesn't stop loving the parent. They immediately stop loving themselves. My mom's always crying, must be my fault. My dad's always angry, must be my fault. So a child's needs aren't met. And when the needs you have as a child aren't met, and here are the needs, they're very simple. I need to feel loved, I need to feel safe, I need to feel protected, I need to feel significant, I need to feel connected. And if for whatever reason those needs aren't met, you go through life with a belief, I, I can't get these needs met, I'm just going to give them up. No one's going to love me, so I just live on my own with my cats and not expect love. And if we don't give them up, we give them away. I I've got to find someone out there. There must be someone who can love me, make me feel worthy. Can you do it? Oh, fantastic. Come into my life. But what if you leave? What if you get sick? I've given you the job of making me feel good enough and and now I feel as needy as I ever felt because it's your job and I still feel not good enough. But Do there's a third any, one. Uh, oh. Meet the need. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yourself. What's the Go third on. way? The third yes. way is to meet the need yourself. If you want someone to go, hey, you're the best thing in the world, you're so lovely, you're so smart, then start to say, I'm smart, I'm kind, I matter, I'm significant. If every child in the world woke up and every day around the breakfast table said, I matter, I'm significant, I'm lovable, I'm enough, and I'm smart, bullying would almost cease to exist. People going for therapy would diminish. Because the most important words we hear are our words. And you might say, well, that's a lie. My kid isn't smart. They're not significant. But when you say that a lot, your mind doesn't go, who's saying that? And is it true? Your mind lets in your words. So most of our issues come from the fact that our needs weren't met. Our needs weren't met as children for so many of us. And now we've given the need up or given it away. Don't do that start to meet the needs, start to say, you know, I'm lovable. If you want love, the only thing you have to do to find it is to say, I am lovable. If you want to lose a ton of weight and stop binging on cakes and start to say, I love my body. It's an amazing thing. And I'm treating it with respect. If you want a promotion or a pay rise, start to say, I'm smart i got something to offer the world, and I'm worthy of wealth and success. You may say, I don't believe it, but you see, the thing with the mind is it doesn't care or know if what you tell it is right or wrong, useful or useless, good or bad, it will let it in. So saying I have an amazing memory as opposed to a terrible memory, I got a super efficient metabolic rate as opposed to I can't lose weight, saying I'm really smart as opposed to I'm a bit thick, really, 
your mind doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to your mind. You know, if you think that's not true, we could do something right now. Close your eyes, everybody watching this. And with your eyes closed and your hand in front of your mouth, imagine you're about to eat half of a big, fat, juicy lemon. Just imagine you have half a lemon in your hand and you're squeezing it. You're inhaling that wonderful lemon smell. And now you're squeezing that lemon. Drops of juice are coming to the surface. Stick out your tongue. Lick all those lemon drops onto your tongue, onto your taste buds. And now shove that half a lemon in your mouth and start to eat it. Start to bite into every segment. Swirl that lemon juice around your mouth. Suck it, swirl it, chew it, bite it. Watch your taste buds puckering and swelling as your mind and body start to produce saliva because you're eating a lemon. So continue eating every lemon segment. Chew it, suck it, bite it, swallow it, swirl it around your mouth, and then open your eyes. And how many of you notice that you produce saliva to a thought? And here's a question for you, which you can't get wrong, by the way. Was there a lemon? The answer is yes or no. The answer is no, you're absolutely right, except there was a lemon. It was in your mind. And if your mind says, if you, the answer was yes, there was a lemon, you're also right, because it was in your imagination. Your imagination created saliva to a thought. Was it good or bad? You, who cares? It's neutral. You thought a thought and your body made it real. So when you think, I'm going to mess that up. I'm going to get, I've ruined everything by being late. I'm so clumsy. I'm reading these papers and I just can't take it. And I know I'm going to fail that exam. I invite you to immediately flip that over. I'm reading this. It's all going in. My subconscious mind is like a computer and I'm going to ace that exam. Someone wrote to me, said my kid was lying on the floor having a breakdown because they couldn't get to grips with studying. And I bought your audio perfect studying. I've never met you. They listened to it. And they, in 14 days, they went to the ace there. And they said, Mom, I'm going to do it. be amazing. Marissa said on that recording, my mind is a computer. It takes it all in. And it's all there when I sit down to take the exam. As I read the question, like that Celine Dion song, it's all coming back to me now. And that's what happened. So we have to prepare our mind. When I was having a baby, I, told, I made myself a recording. Birth is so easy. I give birth to that baby in five hours. I can't wait to lift the head out. My muscles, the long ones, contract. The round ones relax. And that baby just slides out of my body. And I have postnatal euphoria because I always think about postnatal depression. And I had postnatal euphoria. I was thrilled to have this baby. The birth was easy. I weighed exactly the same a week later. I probably sound super annoying now and sicklingly glib. But I told myself, wow, my body's making a baby. It's a miracle. And my body knows how to deliver a baby. And it also knows how to go back to a normal weight. And it also knows how to create milk. And I'd also say to my baby, you know, even in the womb, you sleep at night and you're awake during the day. And we're so blissfully happy. And we were. But, you know, you can also go, oh, my God. God, it's terrible. You know, the weight takes four years to go and you don't get a minute's peace. You can't even have a shower once you have a baby, which is kind of bizarre because they sleep so much. Oh, it's so stressful. And I really feel sorry for people having babies because they have so much propaganda that tells them, it ruins yeah, the like marriage. The, like the terrible the, the, news, the, my the, son. The, yeah, my son is two-year-old and everybody are like, how are you handling the terrible twos? I'm like, well, you know, sometimes he's emotional. Sometimes he's he wants to just be, yeah, just be and 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 express himself. And sometimes it's uncomfortable for me because he, he expresses himself in crying, yeah. yelling, and throwing a tantrum. But it's not the terrible twos. He's, he's a, not a little. Uh, no, he's a person. And one of the best things to do when you're raising children is go, this is age-appropriate behavior. This is normal for two. This is totally normal for a 14-year-old to go, I hate you. I wish I'd never been born. It's all <laughs> age-appropriate. Yeah, sometimes. You know, I can't get my kid out of yeah. bed. Well, that's not going to be in there when they're 16, I yeah, promise sometimes you. Sometimes I, uh, I even go and I check yeah. his books. And if some word is wrong, so there was one book where they said, Oh, you stupid one! Why do you ask me that? And 
And instead of stupid, I deleted it and I and I wrote silly or funny or silly funny or something yes. like that. Something that is doesn't have mm -hmm. the even even at this age, their subconscious mind is yeah. so in this age. Their subconscious mind is so open. I yes. think they are in theta for the next for the first year and then um so in they're in oh, I can yeah. fix no, that, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, Go on. So they're, they're in, in their brain waves are in in a very receptive way. Receptive way, they don't they don't have their critical yeah. minds to tell them what you're saying is right or wrong. Yeah. Before the age of five, before the age of five, children have no logic whatsoever, only feeling, and so you can't use logic. And I love the fact that Penelope Cruz took all her little girls' books, and at the end when it said, "And she married the happy prince." handsome prince and lived happily oh she changed it and went, oh, he said will you marry she said no i'm really sorry i'm going off to be an astronaut <laughs> when she met the handsome prince and he asked for a hand i'm so sorry i'm going to be a doctor now come back in 10 years should i changed all the ending because i wanted my two girls not to think happiness is in marrying a handsome prince and living happily ever after and i love the fact you know because it's all about the stories we tell ourselves and every client i see and indeed you being now being an rtt therapist too you know that a client comes in and they begin to reveal the story of their life and we have the honor and the absolute joy of making sure that that story now takes a different direction i wasn't loved i can find love now i didn't have a good education i'm finding one now um, I'm not good at stuff. I have an absolute gift. You know, my, I was told at school I'd amount to nothing. And I'm actually very glad now because it gave me that, I'll show you, I will show you. And I had such an affinity with children who don't get support and don't feel love. And so when I wrote my book with, with I'll show it to you again, with the 10 different stories, each client in here is a story. One believed he was stupid one had a fear of needles, one lady couldn't orgasm or even get connected to anyone, one had bulimia, one had, had OCD, one had alcoholism, and one was numb because of the death of her children. And in each story, I invite the reader to go, look, if you identify with Tara here, and this is what I did, there's a section called RTT for me that says, you know, you may not even have to go to therapy. You might, but you can take these techniques and do them at home. And and within the book is there are four different audios. One of them is called Installing the Cheerleader. You see, many of us have got a critic going, you can't do that. That won't work out. And I created something called Installing the Cheerleader. Many other hypnotherapists are using it now, but it shows you how to have a cheerleader in your mind that whoops and cheers and goes, you've got this, you can do this. And what made me immensely happy was last year over 500 English schools, sorry, let me say that again, last year, Oh, more than 500 UK schools took this challenge. Let's put in a cheerleader in place of the critic. And actually each school had a prototype for a cheerleader and all the head teachers and class teachers said, you know, this is incredible. It's really helping the children's confidence. It's really helping their learning. And imagine if you had a cheerleader in your mind that said, you've got this, you can do this. You're amazing because your cheerleader never goes, oh, you were terrible today you stank up the place oh my god i don't know why you ever thought you could ever do that you were rubbish they go listen you did a great job wasn't perfect but next time you'll be even more amazing and i love the fact that we have the power to install a cheerleader in our children in ourselves it says things like you can do this you're amazing no one could do this better than you and even if it's not perfect, it's still amazing. I know when I wrote my first book, it was a little daunting, and I was very aware that I had a choice. I could go, oh, my God, this book's terrible. No one's going to buy this. It's going to get the worst reviews in the world. It's going to sink. And I knew if I said that, I could never finish it. So I began to go, this book is amazing. Everyone's going to love this book. I can imagine it in the... Um, windows of stores. And I said to my daughter one day, you know, one day, darling, mummy's book's going to be all in this store window. And actually that happened and we stood outside and took photos. And it sounds very arrogant, but I had a choice. And we always have a choice. Rationalize why it's so awful or talk 
yourself out of it. You have a choice in every situation. Rationalize why you feel so bad or talk yourself out of it. I can't possibly write a book, Who Am I? Or, well, I can. This relationship's never going to work out. I'm amazing. I'm too scared to go to my boss and ask for a promotion. I deserve it. And so for me, I put my cheerleader in when I wrote my first book. And, I've now, and I remember when I finished that, my agent said, where's the next one? I went, oh, no, I couldn't write another one. That was it. That was all I've got. But I've now just written, I've just now, my, sorry, now my seventh book is being released. And now I'm going to write one every year because I really love it. But when you're so write, productive. I mean, you have courses, you travel a lot, you, you help so many people. Like, how can you do everything? And how can you do so much? What, what's your secret? Well, the secret. It's not really a secret. When you do what you love and love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. I've always believed, because I watched my father again, if you do what you love and you love what you do, you actually feel like you never work a day in your life. So I'm very lucky that I love what I do. And it gives me so much. You know, to have a career that's amazing, you need actually nine things. You need to have connection, significance, diversity, You need to have meaning and purpose. You need to grow, contribute, make a difference. I've forgotten the, um, I think, connection, diversity, significance. One, I've forgotten one of them. But being a therapist and being a writer, you, you get very connected to your audience. You do feel significant. You do have diversity. You do have purpose. You have meaning in your life. You grow and contribute, but also you make a difference. And not only that, it's not just to other people, it's to yourself. So when I write books, you'll write back and say, that book saved my life. That book was the one thing that got me to leave a marriage where I was being beaten up. Someone said, you know, that book, I left a marriage where I was being beaten. I went to my supervisor to get my husband out of the house, and he did. I crossed into a store and said, can I have a job? They said, yes. She said, every step I took was because of that book. And for me, that, that just brought me to tears. It was so amazing that something I wrote could change someone's life, but not just her life. Those two kids that watched Daddy beat Mummy on a regular basis, their life was changed too. So I love what I do because every need I have, purpose, meaning, connection, significance, diversity, making a difference, growing, they're all met every day. And so I think when you find out what you love and what makes your heart sing and you have a career of it, I love it. I love being on stage. I love teaching. I mean, I teach um, RTT therapy. Last year I was in Berlin and Miami and Los Angeles And this year we're teaching again in New York, Miami, Los Angeles, London, uh, Berlin, and Amsterdam. But it's such fun. I'm on the road. My sister works for my company. My daughter works for my company, my husband. So we have a great life. And every day I think, wow, I'm so lucky. I mean, I really, truly love it. It doesn't even feel like work. I mean, sometimes when I've got to do edits and look at thousands of emails it's a challenge but I always wake up and think I love my life and I'm lucky and I think that's important when you wake up you go oh <laughs> when I wake up the first thing I say is I love my life I love my life I got a great song I love my life my friend wrote it Niraj I love my life and you see one of the things about the mind is whatever you focus on it moves towards so I focus on what I love And how lucky I am. And yeah, the cake, you know, last year, I must admit, when I went from Los Angeles to Miami to Berlin to Spain to London, to, by the time I got back, it's like, oh, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> But that'll take two days and I'll be back and I've got one more course and then I'm going to be celebrating. And so yeah. you, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And it's very easy to go, this is exhausting. This is so stressful. I'm far too old to do this. Or to go, wow, I'm so lucky that I'm not retiring. I've got a fabulous life. And I think, you know, having a sense mm -hmm. of gratitude is incredibly important. It, every day you look for the little things that make you happy. Like I still get excited about my first tea, my first coffee, 
waking up and feeding my cat. So I think when you can train yourself to get pleasure from simple things, the sunrise, hearing someone laugh, a phone call with my daughter or my sister or my best friend, once you get immense pleasure from little things, every day becomes like Christmas. And so, but that's all, it's all a choice. I'm choosing to love where I am, to always look for what's great about it. And, and the other thing that really has always helped me is to remember, and we can all do this, your life is someone else's fantasy dream come true. They would love a husband that left underpants on the floor. They'd love kids that left peanut butter smears on the fridge. Right. They would love a baby that kept them up all night. Someone in the world, I, 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 your life is my fantasy. And so that, that really helps you get it into yeah, perspective. That's so beautiful. What are your three top tips to live in a stellar life? Well, the first one would always be join the I'm Enough movement. You know, I've worked with thousands and thousands of clients. I've been a therapist for 34 years, and I can tell you without skipping a beat that they almost all have the same underlying issue. I'm not enough. I'm not worthy enough, lovable enough, smart enough, attractive enough, thin enough. And so my top tip is every day say, I am enough. You might notice I am, actually, this, I wear these I'm enough bracelets all the time. I have I'm enough everywhere. I have it on, usually it's behind me. I have it on cushions. I have it on mirrors. If you can just say I'm enough every day, that will, I promise you, change your life. Because when you know you're enough, you feel able to get what you like. When you think you're not enough, you need more, more food, more cake, more alcohol, more stuff. So my top tip is know you're enough. My second top tip would be live in an attitude of gratitude. Be really grateful for where you are. And my third top tip would be it's not important to be right. It's important to be kind. I mean, there's so many top tips. Would that be my third? I'm of course, I, and there's so many to <laughs> choose from. Know that you're enough. Live in a state of gratitude. And actually, yeah, it's not important to be right. It's important to be kind. I work with many, many suicidal children, especially teenage boys, and they always say the same thing. Somebody made me wrong. My dad said I was wrong. My teacher said I was wrong. My girlfriend said I was wrong. And when you are always right, you're making someone else wrong. I've made many, many mistakes yeah. in my life, and I can't change them. But I can practice forgiveness for myself and for other people. So... They would be my top tips. If I had another, would be be nice to yourself. You know, people say, I, I don't know how to love myself. What is self-love? Well, self-love is three things. The first is, how do you talk to yourself? Do you go, oh, I'm just an idiot. Look at me. I've got rocks to brains. My legs are so fat. That's not self-love. That's self-hatred. So if you want to practice self-love, mm. say nice things. I've got lovely, shiny eyes, my arms at a safe place for my children or grandchildren. I'm, I'm a nice person. It doesn't matter about the size of your thighs or even your bank account or the label in your clothes. That's the wrong question. I'm a good person. So how you talk to yourself, how you dialogue with you is the number one indicator of are you practicing self-love. The second indicator is how do you treat yourself? Do you drink water? Do you get enough sleep? Do you eat better food or do you live on diet coke and pringles and stay up all night binging on netflix because that's not love that's abuse so practice self-love in how you dialogue with you how you treat you and the third way is how do other people treat you do you let people diminish you and put you down do you allow people to hurt you do you allow people to use you when you say when someone says can i borrow your car can i borrow money can i borrow your coat and it doesn't you have to say no, sorry, that doesn't work for me. I can't, don't say sorry too much. Can you have my kids all weekend? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got other plans. So don't let people treat you badly. And the more you practice the first one, dialoguing better with yourself, the easier it is to practice the second and the third one. So that would be another tip. That's how to practice self-love, how you talk to you, how you treat you, how you allow others to treat Thank you. you. so much. Um, where can people find you, connect with you, get your new book? Oh, yeah, I'm going to show it to you one more time. 
It's really, it, you can get this everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere. So how can you find me? I'm very lucky my parents call me Marissa Peer because it's an unusual name. So marissapeer.com is my website. And we give away tons of free audios on love blocks, health blocks, wealth blocks. Yeah. RTT.com is where you can go to learn how to train with me and do what I do. It is the best job in the world. I'm sure you agree because you do it now too. You can also find a great therapist who I trained who's probably every bit as good as me, also in RT.com. If you want some of these bracelets, go to I'mEnough.com. And if you want to buy this book, and it is a great book. It really will help you be the person you want to be. Go to Amazon.com. And I think for the first week, we're doing an amazing offer where you can buy the ebook for 99 wow. cents, which is amazing because each of the four downloads is worth about mm -hmm. $30 each. So yeah. it's a great deal. Wow, and congratulations. And I'd love you to have it, and I'd love you to have it. Yeah, I'm, I'm Thank very you so excited much. to get the book, and it's going to be amazing. Well, send me your details. I'll send you a signed copy. I'd be delighted thank to. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Marisa. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom. Uh, thank you for being a big part of my life. Just before you go, can I just, can I just ask you one thing? Tell me what your life is like practicing RTT. I know we're running out of time, but I'd love to know. Uh, it's beautiful. I, I, I love it. I love this. I love the method. I love how it changes people's lives. I'm really, really happy about it. And how did it change your um, life? Yeah. How does it change? It got me back in my purpose, which is helping others. And just the community that we have right now, we are still in touch with the other RTT therapists from the Miami retreat. And uh, I've created a mastermind and we meet and we share ideas. So now I have this community of incredible people because you, you, attract really incredible people into your trainings like all the RTT people, RTT therapists are unbelievable they're they're yeah. such beautiful souls and it was such a beautiful experience to be there it definitely moved me forward um because uh, there were so many shifts in my life we went from LA to Israel and then we moved to Florida and there was so much so much going on that it got me centered on my focus mm -hmm. and going back to my strength and my destiny and um, just put me on a better path. Like I'm so grateful that I am a part of this community and that I studied with you and that I got to know you. I'm like really, really a blessing in my life. And also for, for a mother, it is such a blessing because you can work entirely around your beautiful two-year-old son and many people just don't have that luxury. So I think as a parent, I always felt, blessed that I could be a therapist because I could be with my daughter when she needed me, I could be with my clients when they needed me, but I never had to go, oh, my daughter needs me, I've got to go to work. My client needs me, but I can't do it. I was always able to balance them both in a really almost seamless way. So I think for women, it's yeah. such a great job because you pick your own hours. It gives you so much freedom, but also an immense sense of purpose. So I'm glad you love it. Love so that it. makes my day. Thank and you. And I'm so grateful that I, you know, the stars aligned and, and I, you know, somehow I, <laughs> some, did. somehow, you know, it happened, you know, when you manifest things, my, my husband heard an interview of mm. you and then he had me listen to that interview and I was like, wow, I want to learn everything this woman has to offer. She's unbelievable. I was so touched and impressed. And I think it was two years later that I, 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 I became a therapist. So thank you for that. But there you are. You thought you wanted to learn everything I had to offer, and now you've learned it, and now you offer the same thing as I offer to your clients, which is a, yeah, thank a wonderful thing, really thank beautiful you so much. thing. And thank you. Thank you, listeners. Remember to say, I am enough every day. Live in an attitude of gratitude. Be kind to yourself and to others and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. <laughs>